Central banks run the monetary systems of countries or monetary unions. In many ways they are actually more powerful and important than the government itself. Despite this fact, not many people are familiar with the fact that they even exist, what their roles and obligations are, and what makes them so powerful and important. In this video, we will go over why central banks were created, how our currency is created, fractional reserve banking, the functions and responsibilities of central banks, and monetary policies that they use to try and meet their goals and obligations. But before we do, feel free to subscribe for more videos on personal finance, investing, motivation and success, like the video if you find it informative and share it with a friend if you think it will help them. First, let's go through some history and basic banking concepts before we dive into defining the central banks themselves, to make sure you understand the background behind it all better. Before central banks were created, every bank issued its own banknotes. All of them were valid, so there were literally thousands of banknotes around at a time. The Bank of England, established in 1694, is considered the first central bank and the model on which modern central banks are based. Now, although it didn't have all the functions and responsibilities of a modern central bank, it had one crucial privilege. It was the only corporation allowed to issue banknotes in England at a time, and it issued them against government bonds. This new banking model quickly spread through Europe, and before the end of the 19th century, many European countries established their own central banks. In 1907, a financial crisis took place in the US that was a consequence of lots of bank runs and in turn caused many banks, especially small local ones, as well as businesses to declare bankruptcy. This event is officially the main reason that led Congress to enact the Federal Reserve Act in 1913, which led to the creation of the Federal Reserve System, also known as the Fed, the central banking system of the USA. The officially declared motives of the Fed are supervising banking in the US, thus making sure the banking panics are addressed in the future, to serve as a central bank for the US, stabilizing the monetary system and some other purposes. Since 1971, the US dollar is no longer backed by gold, and like all other major currencies has become a fiat currency, meaning that it has no intrinsic value whatsoever, and it remained as such ever since, just like the other currencies have. This removed some limitations, thus allowing the central banks even greater control over their currency. Now, I won't go into some additional juicy controversial details regarding central banks in this video, instead I'll stick to the official purposes and roles of central banking, but don't worry, great resources that you can use to do your own research will be provided at the end of the video, so make sure to watch it all the way through. In order to better understand how central banks plan to achieve their declared goals, we must first understand fractional reserve banking, which is to date the most common form of banking practice worldwide. As the name suggests, this involves commercial banks holding reserves that are equal to only a fraction of their liabilities, and this fraction is determined by the central bank and is referred to as the reserve requirements. Ok, but what does this mean in plain English? Well, I'll give you an example. If the central bank says that the reserve requirement is, let's say, 10%, this means that banks must hold in reserves only one unit of currency for every 10 units deposited, cause 1 is 10% of 10. In practical terms, if you deposit $10,000 in this scenario, and it's now in the system, it's a liability for the bank, as they owe you 10k, but it's also an asset for the bank, as they are allowed to distribute $9,000 to other people. This in turn lets banks create money out of thin air by using fractional reserve lending and issuing debt, which creates a liability for the lender, but an asset for the bank. How? Well, let's just continue with the example. You gave your 10k to the bank, they said they'll keep it safe, and this is Mia. She walked in the bank asking for a $9,000 loan. The bank says, sure, here you go, and gives her 9k, but you still have the full 10k in your account, while she has the 9k in her hands, meaning the system now has 19k in it. The loan is a liability for Mia, as the bank loaned her the money and she has to pay it back over the specified term, plus some interest, but it's an asset for the bank, as they will receive regular interest payments from her until she pays off her debt. Now, a very important thing to note here is the fact that issuing debt allowed the bank to create $9,000 out of thin air by issuing credit to Mia. And this is perfectly fine, as the 10% of 10k that you deposited earlier are still in the reserves, meaning that they meet the reserve requirement. The amount of money that banks generate for each dollar of reserves is referred to as money multiplier. So, Mia spends the 9k buying a fancy vacation from Josh, who owns a travel agency and he decides to deposit the whole 9k into a bank. 
Joshi's 9k deposit is a new liability and asset at the same time for the bank. Remember, the bank owes Josh 9k, so it's a liability for the bank, but they only have to keep 10% in reserves and are allowed to use the remaining 8100 as an asset. And what do you know, Brandon just walked in asking for an 8100 USD loan and he got the loan. Bear in mind that you still have your 10k in your account, Josh still has his 9k in his account and Brandon has 8100 in his hands. So there is $27,100 in the system now and it's all legit currency despite the fact that most of it is created out of thin air. Now the fact that a bank holds only a fraction of the money in reserves also means that in many cases they will lend most of the depositors money while still guaranteeing to them that they are keeping it all safe and that they can come and withdraw it all at any time. Now that's obviously not the case though, and if all of the depositors or just a lot of them rush to the bank to withdraw their deposits, the bank will run into liquidity issues, they simply will not have the needed amount of money at hand and will not be able to give the depositors their own money back. This is what happened in the US in 1907 to many banks and they had to declare bankruptcy. Ok, now we have enough background information to actually start talking about central banks and their roles in modern economies. As I already mentioned, central banks are usually completely separate entities and are not a part of the government, but let me just note the fact that the Fed chairman is appointed by the US president. Central banks have different names in different countries. As we already know, the US Central Bank is the Fed, the Federal Reserve System. In the European Union is the ECB, European Central Bank, and almost every country has its own one. The main functions and responsibilities of central banks are Controlling the nation's money supply. They print banknotes and put them into circulation, but can also destroy them to remove them from circulation if needed. Being the banker's bank and the lender of last resort. If a bank runs out of money during a bank run, they can borrow money from the central bank to avoid going bankrupt. Supervising and regulating the banking industry. Setting the minimum deposit requirements for commercial banks and making sure that they stick to them. Being the government's banker and managing the government bonds. Implementing the country's monetary policy. Managing the country's foreign exchange and gold reserves and most importantly, making the like button turn blue. So, how do central banks create money? Well, the issuance of banknotes is a privilege that only central banks enjoy. And the fact that they regulate reserve requirements of commercial banks means that only they have complete control over both the issuing of banknotes and the entire creation of money. While over 90% of the money is created by a fractional reserve banking mechanism, the central banks can also create money directly for the government needs. So if the government needs money to fund their operations, they have multiple options. They can increase taxes to raise more money, but that doesn't sound fun, so nope, what's next? They can cut their budgets to save some money, but that also doesn't sound fun. Next! The next option is having the treasury department call up the Fed and simply ask for some money. Ok, this one sounds less scary, at least to most people, so how does it happen? Well, the treasury issues government bonds that the central bank buys through commercial banks who serve as an intermediary. The money that the central bank uses to buy the bonds is of course created out of thin air. Now those bonds that the central bank just purchased are government debt and like any other debt they carry interest. Meaning that by using this method, the government just increases its total debt amount and the cost of servicing debt. Now, add to that the fact that new currency in circulation decreases the value of all already existing currency, so while option 3 sounded like a free lunch to some, in reality the people end up paying a hidden tax, called inflation. Also, let's not forget that the US dollar is the world reserve currency, meaning that other countries are holding it in their reserves, so those other countries also face the risk of their own reserves decaying when the US dollar suffers from inflation. Central banks actually make a profit off of this kind of money creation, as the money they create, out of thin air by the way, is usually only available at the cost of interest. They can keep the profit, but they most often just give it to the government. Ok, let's now take a look at key monetary policies and how they shape our economies. The most important goals that central banks are actively trying to reach by conducting monetary policy include economic stability and growth, a healthy amount of inflation, usually 2-3% annually, 
low unemployment rates, stability of financial and foreign exchange markets, and so on. The main tools that central banks use in their monetary policies are the interest rate at which they lend money to commercial banks and the amount of money in circulation. Now, how does this even affect us? If, for example, the economy is slowing down and a central bank wants to simulate it, they can try doing so by increasing the money supply and lowering the interest rates while maintaining target inflation, also known as expansionary monetary policy. As the interest rates drop, commercial banks can borrow money from the central bank at a lower cost, and thus the interest rates we, consumers, get also tend to drop. This in turn gives both businesses and people the opportunity to take out a loan while the rates are so low. So, consumers can get cheaper loans, including mortgages, at lower rates, which encourages them to upscale their homes. Add to that the fact that lower interest rates also apply to their savings accounts, which now earn them lower interest, further incentivizing them to spend the money or invest it. The businesses use the cheap loans to invest into themselves and grow faster, making more products and services, improving existing ones and marketing them to generate more sales. This often requires more workers, so people in general have more work available, often with better wages. Now bear in mind that one man's spending is another man's income, and as people make more money, they also tend to spend more money. So the businesses make and sell more products and services, thus receiving more profits and creating more income in the form of wages for their employees. And the people spend the money at businesses as they buy more of the products and services, so the businesses make even more money, can hire even more people and maybe even offer better wages, which now in turn makes people make even more and spend even more, and thus an upward spiral is created. As the economy starts rolling again, if the money supply starts growing faster than the actual economy, the central banks tend to increase the interest rates and the reserve requirements, thus shortening the money supply to avoid too much inflation, also known as contractionary monetary policy. Now, all of this described so far are more or less the standard operations of central banks. But what happens if the interest rates are zero or near zero, and the reserve requirements are very low, but the economy is still not showing positive progress? Well, in this case, the central banks often resort to open market operations in hopes of giving more liquidity to banks, and sometimes the scale of this goes overboard, which is referred to as quantitative easing. Quantitative easing, often called QE, is a monetary policy where a central bank buys government bonds and other financial assets to inject money into the economy in hopes of expanding economic activity. Wait, isn't that the same thing as the money creation through buying plain government bonds and increasing government deficit? It's similar, yes, but actually very different. In the prior example, the main purpose of the money was to fund government projects, so it's focused almost exclusively on buying government bonds, and doing it at a quote-unquote normal scale. Now, when it comes to quantitative easing, next to the government bonds and financial assets, the sky's the limit, really, as it may include corporate bonds, mortgage-backed securities, stocks, and maybe even like button smashes. Buying financial assets from commercial banks and other financial institutions is the main target though, as it increases the money supply while raising the prices of those financial assets and lowering their yield. This should in theory further incentivize lending and stimulate the economy even more. Another very important difference is the scale of those purchases, as QE is usually done only when inflation is stubbornly not picking up, despite the monetary policies that are already in place, so it's the last resort in hopes of avoiding deflation. Now, one might wonder, why is deflation so scary that the central banks go to such great lengths to avoid it and stimulate the economy? Isn't high inflation the scary one? Well, they're both scary, actually. One of the key ingredients of the successful monetary policy example presented earlier was the fact that target inflation was maintained. As long as there is some inflation, but not too much, people see the prices around them go up, and along with all the other incentives, that also incentivizes them to spend or invest the money as soon as possible rather than saving it. If deflation was present, they might look at the declining prices and think to themselves, hey, if I just wait a couple of months or even years and buy this later, it's gonna cost me way less, so why would I even bother putting my money at risk by investing it when this deflation thing gives me guaranteed risk-free returns? Let me remind you again that one man's spending is another man's income, and since people are not spending, businesses are not selling as much. 
Since businesses are not selling as much, they have to pause research and development and also scale down, meaning that some people are gonna lose their jobs. As people lose their jobs, they lose their income. And now they really want to save that money, as they have no idea when the next paycheck will arrive. This causes even less income for the businesses and even more layoffs. And now you can see how a downward spiral is forming. That's why the central banks fight so hard to avoid deflation. We can see from all of this that a central bank truly is the most important entity in a given country. The fact that central banks effectively have a monopoly on the entire money creation and that they can create booms and busts in an economy makes them a crucial force. And as they say, with great power comes great responsibility. Failure to properly implement monetary policies already led us to disasters. The Great Depression that began in 1929 was an example where slow action by the Fed caused the worst market decline in history. Financing massive budget deficits prolonged the great inflation of the 1970s, while overstimulation during the early 2000s led to risky lending and investments that resulted in the subprime mortgage crisis of 2008. Understanding central banks, their roles and the way they conduct monetary policy really seems like very important when we take all of this into the account. Yet most people have no idea about any of those things, so I really hope this video made you understand it better. Now, there are many controversial details regarding central banks and many resources that cover them. You can try looking up the events that I just mentioned and reading The Creature from Jekyll Island by G. Heather Griffin if you really want a detailed story. I'll make a summary of it once I reread it and the link will be available in the description. If you want to keep a closer eye on what the Fed is doing on a pretty much day-to-day -day basis and hear some juicy details, there are creators here on YouTube who dedicated their channels to doing pretty much that. George Gammon and The Money GPS are good examples. Thank you for watching and again, I really hope this video was useful to you. Feel free to subscribe for more personal finance, investing and motivation related content as well as weekly book summaries. Also ring the notification bell, leave a like on the video so more people can actually see it and share it with a friend if you think it will help them. I'll see you next week so enjoy the rest of your day. Bye bye!